So it seems like most people are back from lunch, so we can uh, perhaps we can go ahead and, and get started. So the plan for the, this afternoon, what we thought we'd do is we'll, we'll start off with this, this lecture, and then afterwards uh, we thought that since this is the beginning of week two, it would be good to uh, learn to share a little bit about the, the projects that uh, people to thinking, are thinking to work on and, and you've been thinking about. So we'll, we'll just sort of go around the room and then uh, each, each person or group can just say a few words about uh, what they're planning to do. And uh, so we, we can just uh, share our plans and uh, have feedback at, at this stage. And then later through the week, we'll, we'll have opportunities to uh, uh, present more, more tools for using in the context of the, of the projects. For example, the, uh, the, the NJO phase composites or BCSO, boreal summer interseasonal oscillation, uh, to, to think about the, the sources of, of predictability over your region uh, that you didn't get a chance to do last week. We, 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 we can present, I think Paola presented it already last week, but we, we, can, we can present that again, uh, as well as some, some, some other tools. And I think the emphasis all, all the time is that there are, there are many tools uh, to, available uh, as options, but uh, these are not by no means obligatory in terms of, well, you need to apply these tools. So to begin, we thought it would be nice, uh, since this didn't, there wasn't any lectures on, on this in, in the first week, and we're starting to think in the second week especially about, uh, well, how could uh, S2S forecast be applied specifically in a, in a region toward uh, uh, helping manage various climate-related risks or early, early warning of hazards, to say something about how we verify uh, forecasts, forecast verification. Uh, some of this may be, may be uh, well known to many of you, but maybe not to all people. And then I think I'm going to be uh, raising more questions than answers about how it is uh, that we should go about verifying sub-seasonal forecasts. So what I'll say is, is mostly, mostly uh, relates to the seasonal forecast scale, but uh, many of the same metrics are also used, uh, also used in, in weather forecasting. But we need to think about well, what it is uh, that we actually want to, to verify. Should it be a, a weekly average or uh, in, in terms of the sub-seasonal scale, what it is that we're really interested in? So... We'll talk a little bit about what makes a good forecast, some, some, something on, a little bit on skill scores, uh, verification of probabilistic forecasts. And then I want to show you that we, we do have a, a sub-project on, on verification within S2S. Uh, and so far, it has lots of plans, but, but uh, uh, not much done yet. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities for, for developing uh, Subseasonal forecast verification on on, on subseasonal scales, and I'll I'll, I'll try to, to give you a, a some hopefully convey some feeling for 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 that. So, what makes a good forecast? Uh, these are three three aspects of uh, what makes a good forecast that that uh, uh, come from a slide by uh, Simon Mason from the IRI. So, Simon has worked on. Uh, forecast verification for for many years, uh, and uh, he's he's even developed his own scores. He's a uh, he's a leader in the the uh, field of forecast verification, and, and a couple of slides come from him actually. So he identifies these three things: uh, quality, value, and consistency. And forecast quality. So the forecast uh, should correspond with what actually happens, right? This. This sort of seems intuitive, that, that uh, you would want uh, that to be the case. Uh, right at the outset, I realize I don't have any slides on that in my presentation, but what actually happens means you need data. And for, sub for the subseasonal scale, that may not be uh, as obvious as for the seasonal scale. For seasonal, if you're thinking about uh, precipitation, uh, Seasonal average of, of precip month would you could build from monthly averages, but if you're thinking of uh, subseasonal scales, whereas uh, Vincent was showing, we're, we're, we're really thinking about daily variability. Then then we need uh, we need daily precipitation data sets to be able to do that, and those are much more challenging. 
So there's the, in, in terms of verification, the developing the uh, data sets of, of daily precipitation and, and, and uh, having confidence in those data sets, there, 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 are, uh, there are several available, uh, is, is, is a challenge. So they could, the forecast should correspond with what actually happens. So this includes skill, reliability, sharpness, discrimination, and other forecast attributes. So they call these attributes uh, of a forecast, of forecast quality, things like skill, uh, sharpness, etc. And I'll, I'll, I'll say a few more words about those in, in, the sli in the later slides. Then value, that's something we talked about this, in this morning's lecture. Uh, not only should they correspond with what actually happens, but they should, should be potentially useful. So they should come at the right time, uh, be timely to the decision, uh, be specific, uh, be, be, uh, may require downscaling of uh, forecast to local level, and be salient in terms of we, we talked about uh, uh, the, the, the forecast quantities could be something, uh, should be something related to the decision. And then finally here, this, this one on consistency, the forecast should indicate what the experts really think. Well, I mean, that seems like a, a, a no-brainer, right? <laughs> but uh, there, there can be problems with, with actually fulfilling this if the forecasters want to hedge their bets. And uh, they, they, may, they, may, they, they, they may have uh, estimates of the probability of below normal rainfall or, or drought coming from their tools, but they don't quite trust. They have a feeling that uh, this is maybe a too to extreme forecast, so they'll, they'll hedge. And uh, so they don't actually issue what's, uh, what, what, they, what they really think. And so it's important for them to do that. It hurts skill if you don't. And uh, in terms of a skill score, it has impl implications that the, the skill score should, should give, you, you should have an optimal forecast if you were to uh, uh, Use as your forecast the, the, the true probability of, a, of, of uh, the event happening. So skill, uh, this really gets to the question, is one, is one set of forecasts better than another? So skill is a, is a comparative measure. A skill score is used to compare the quality of one forecast strategy with that of, that of another, uh, a reference set. The skill score defines a percentage improvement over the reference forecast. So often the, the reference forecast would be some kind of uh, climatological, climatological uh, forecast. And so this is a relative measure of forecast quality uh, compared to this, this climatological reference. But still uh, better in, in uh, what respect, we still need to define what, what we mean by what we mean by good. So how do we do this? Uh, assetting, assessing a, a, a set of forecasts, uh, comparing with what actually happened, we can uh, do it in this way. And it, so we, we compare one forecast with this observation, a second forecast with another, with with uh, a second observation, etc. And this is normally done normally done in time. So that uh, for seasonal forecasts, these would these would be uh, distinct years. Say for uh, the summer of uh, 1979, 1980, 1981, like that. And th there's two ways that, that that you can do that, and that are typically uh, used to do that. And one is is to, to to do this based on real time forecasts that were actually issued in real time, which would seem to be the which, which is the ideal, really, because you you what you want. If, if, if you have a, a set of forecasts, set of forecasts available, you'd like to be able to compare that with with what at, with what actually happened. Or the other the other uh, strategy is to use hindcasts, which uh, are also, uh, especially on the subseasonal scale, referred to as reforecasts, uh, where you you go and you take your model and you run it for for uh, previous years. So these are made respectively for past years or, uh, yeah, for, for past years. So for forecast centers that have been uh, uh, 
in the business for some time. They, they, they would be able to, to do this for real-time forecasts. It has actually been done now for the region, the, some of the regional climate outlook fora. Since those climate outlook fora have been going since uh, the late 90s, uh, people have gone back and tried to verify and see, well, how good have they actually been? Because this is the, the key question that uh, uh, users, need, users of those, those products uh, need to know. So, so Simon, Simon Mason, among others, has, has, has done that. At, at the IRI, we have a, a portal for uh, uh, a map room for forecast verification. And that is based on our real-time forecast. So the, the real-time forecast we've been issuing since uh, around 1998. So if you, if you look at those scores, they are issued, they are based on what we actually did issue going back every month uh, since, since 1998. But more typically, you'll find uh, in, in seasonal forecasting that people don't do that. And especially you could imagine since uh, forecast systems are being updated all the time, you might want to know, well, how good is my today's forecast system versus one that we had uh, 20 years ago? So typically, we'll use hindcasts or, or reforecasts to do this uh, verification. And that, in that, th this can be uh, also of... Uh, maybe of greater scientific use, because then you can compare uh, two forecast systems, your, your previous version versus a, a, a recent version. And uh, particularly in the, in the S2S database, where many of those models are uh, run on the fly so that they, they're updated often. So uh, what you will be able to do in the S2S database is uh, go and look back uh, at those reforecasts that were issued, uh, you know, in 2015 versus in the future ones that will be issued in 2017, because say for the ECMWF system, you will have reforecasts associated with every every start that's made, and they'll all be archived in in the database. So typically, it's uh, typically in 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 modeling, we 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 do this based on on hindcasts and reforecasts. And this is what I meant about consistency here. Uh, sometimes it's called a, a proper, in terms of a, a skill score, a proper scoring rule is designed such that quoting the true distribution as the forecast distribution is an optimal, optimal strategy uh, if you average over, over many cases. So in the end, when we, we, we aggregate these all together, uh, we get some kind of skill score. And so I'm mentioning here that this would be done generally in time. And uh, in, in seasonal forecasting, these would be different years. So uh, for a particular season, we'll, we'll, we'll do this for uh, previous years of that season. But uh, on the sub-seasonal scale, this could also include many starts within a particular season. So if... Uh, the, the forecasts are issued every week. We can pull together over many weekly starts. Or if the forecasts are issued every day, such as uh, with the NCEP CFS or the CMA model, we, we can even do that uh, pooling, o pooling over daily, daily starts. And so you can see that for sub-seasonal forecasts, it might actually be easier to verify on the real-time forecasts because we have, uh, we have more samples. If we just take our, our real-time forecast, say, from 2015, because we're starting uh, every week, if we, if we av average those together, we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, lot, lots of samples. Uh, normally, there's some seasonality to skills, so we'll want to just do this for, for a particular season. So in terms of scores, one that we often use in the, in the climate community uh, is uh, the simple deterministic score that enables us to, to uh, get an idea of, of, the, uh, of, of the skill of our model. Even if we're not thinking too much of applications, it can t help us scientifically to see if our, if our forecast has some, has some skill or comparing with a previous version, if we have better, better skill. Uh, it's not so... Th this measure 
is not at all recommended for applications. Just because of the, what I was mentioning bef in, the, in this morning's talk about the need for a probabilistic forecast and conveying uncertainty. You don't convey any uncertainty with anomaly correlation coefficient, but it, it can be very useful for uh, scientific use and, and uh, assessing the, the uh, assessing predictability and, and the model's, model's uh, ability to, to capture that. So this is just an association measure. Uh, are increases and decreases in forecasts associated with increases and decreases in observations? It doesn't measure the accuracy. Uh, one nice thing about it is if you square the anomaly correlation coefficient, it tells us how much of the variance in the observations is correctly forecast. Now, if, if you apply this, so X is the model and, and Y is the observation. So here we have the, the, the covariance between those, and then we have the, the, uh, the standard deviations on, on the bottom here. So you notice we have an X bar here uh, and, a, and a Y bar. So these are, these are anomalies. And so uh, if, you, if you want to construct this for your, for your, sub, sub, uh, for your sub-seasonal forecast, you have to think, well, what should I use for my my X bar or my Y bar. And uh, this, would, uh, this would come from the, the, uh, the mean of the, of the hind cast or the reef forecast for X and the mean of the observations for Y. And you can see that this could, could uh, have some, if you're thinking about a weekly time series of this, you, you could have, there, there could be some seasonality in this. So in general terms, we would, we would subtract a, a lead-dependent climatology. So for week one, uh, if it's from, some, from December 1st, uh, the December 1st through 7, we would, we would uh, subtract from the forecast for 2015 the, uh, the forecast for, for uh, all, all other years uh, in the past from that. This skill score, incidentally, is quite sensitive to, to outliers, and so you can get a, a high score. Uh, this shows just in this case that there, uh, there was a good, a good uh, association between the, the forecast and the in, in red and the, the the forecast in in, in red and, and the sorry the observations in red sorry, and, and the, the green is the, the hindcast in, in 1985. And it actually gave a lot of this 0.64 is just coming from that one year. So you have to be, you have to be uh, careful in the, in the interpretation. So here's just another little uh, schematic of, of what this is doing. Uh, all the bias is being subtracted because we subtract off that X bar. Uh, and so even if the, the X bar and the Y bar differ, if there's some bias in the forecast, uh, Compared to the observation, we, we subtract that we subtract that one off, and so it's subtracting the bias, and then also the amplitude bias is is being uh, uh, divided out as well because we have we're dividing by the standard deviation of of x and the standard deviation of y, so it's just just the association of the ups and downs. So what about if we do this uh, for some subseasonal forecast? This is an example from a paper of ours where we, we actually took three models. The, this is before S2S days. We, we did this, although, although the paper's only coming out now, we did this several years ago now. So this is using a, uh, an earlier version of the, uh, the S2S uh, monthly forecast system. And this is showing anomaly correlation for week one, week two, week three, and week four in, uh, lead, lead times. And the scale here, uh, red, red is sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.6. And so you can see how you can use anomaly correlation to, to, get a, uh, to be able to compare between lead times here. So it can be, uh, although this is not a score we would, we would want to be using for administrative use for in, in uh, the use of forecasts, it can be a very useful score for comparing different lead times. So Paula has actually... Uh, has a MATLAB script for, for doing this uh, that, uh, that some of you may care to also, also be a, having downloaded the data uh, to, to actually apply to the, uh, apply to the, uh, the forecast. Or we may have an example 
uh, of, of, of doing that. Uh, we may have a, an example presented uh, later in the week. So, as I mentioned, the lead time uh, climatology is subtracted. This is for boreal summer. So we've pulled over start dates. This is when the ECMWF model was only starting every Monday. Uh, so they also have Thursday starts now as well, uh, all the other way around. So we're just taking all the starts between, uh, I think it was mid-May and mid-September uh, for, uh, for the 1992 to 2008 period. And uh, we're uh, calculating the uh, anomaly correlation for, for each point uh, between those, those weekly time series of the, the model forecasts and the observation. And this case, what do we use for observations? We, we, used a, a, we just used the, the CPC's merged analysis of, of precipitation. So this is a, a, a coarse uh, two and a half degree. It's actually pentad. So this sort of illustrates in, uh, the, uh, the challenges of, of doing this and having the observed data uh, over the full period of the, the hindcasts. So you could do this for, uh, uh, you could say, okay, I'm going to use, uh, uh, is it GPCP that has a, has a one degree version? But I think it just starts at the, uh, the end of the 90s. So it needs to overlap the full period. And so what we did here was to actually interpolate the pentad to daily. It's, it's, not, it's an op, not an optimal thing to do, but since we're uh, verifying on weekly averages, we, we think it's a... a uh, we, we, we think it's uh, a fair approximation. And so, and so that's what we did here. So what do we find? I think you'll, you'll agree that the, there's quite, quite a striking result here in terms of just visualizing uh, sources of predictability. So you can see that in, in the first week, you have a lot of red. And there you have the, uh, the uh, predictability from, from initial conditions of the atmosphere. So uh, when in, in your projects, if you're looking at uh, different forecast ranges, or maybe you did that last week, in the, in the first, first week, uh, second week, third week, fourth week, uh, you, you'll, see a, you'll see a decay in skill generally. And you can certainly see the dramatic uh, drop-off between week one and week two uh, in, in most places. And so this is what we're up, what we're very ambitious in our S2S project that we're actually starting here uh, in, in week three. <laughs> so what came before uh, in the World Weather Research Program's uh, TIGI, TIGI project was to be looking at forecast leads up to 14 days, which is what, what we think of being the limits of deterministic predictability uh, according to weather. But if you look here, you see that already so much has been lost after seven days. So even though the limits may be near two weeks, uh, you, 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 you really lose a lot after a few days, as in that schematic that I was showing in the morning. But then there are patches of red that persist. And uh, maybe you'll find uh, that in your, in your cases. Or maybe you'll be lucky enough that in your country that's the case for some particular season. So this is the boreal summer. Maybe it's different uh, in, in different seasons. Uh, this, is a, this is also an older version of the model. So maybe uh, the, the latest ECMWF system has, has better skill. So if you're looking at, at your own particular region, uh, say, over, say over Colombia here, it, it, it looks pretty dire uh, as we move even beyond the first week. But uh, maybe maybe uh, this is maybe this is the wrong season to be looking looking at this, or we we would like to know uh, how well the models are doing and what might be what might be the sources of predictability. So let's just maybe look at those those red areas there. Uh, any anything stand out uh, in in this one here? It's quite striking how it doesn't decrease as you go. To, to longer lead, and you would think that it should, right? We think, well, uh, the skill should decrease as we go to a longer lead time, but it doesn't seem to be the case here. Any, any, uh, anyone want to uh, throw out a suggestion what, what this, in terms of a source of predictability, what, what this is? You can see it 
right along the equatorial Pacific. Yeah, yeah, and and so yeah, particularly. So really not decaying as we go through the the four weeks, and so even on subseasonal scales, the uh, ENSO uh, can be a source of predictability. And we think of it, we tend to think of it as uh, seasonal, but uh, there can, of course, this is only association. And if we looked at the mean squared skill score or something else, maybe we're going to see that that's not the case. But in terms of association, we, we are seeing that. And then over South, Southeast Asia maritime continent, that's also a region where it's, it's decreasing somewhat, but we see we have uh, some skill there uh, that, that's persisting into these weeks. And, and that, is, that is coming from the, from the MJO. So we looked at actually at three models. And I think that's the, the great thing about uh, uh, the S2S database is now that we can look across models and see uh, how, how well do individual models do in different places. Or can we combine them together to get uh, more skillful forecasts even, even than, than uh, shown by a single model? And then we, we were intrigued by this uh, persistence of the skill over, over, over the maritime continent. So we, we went in and we looked at some particular cases there to, to see if we could get a better understanding of that. And so we picked a particular year, uh, 2002, and then what's shown here is the sea map. This is just averaged over Borneo Island, because Borneo Island turned out to be the, the, the place in the world over the land that had the best skill. So the, uh, the S2S uh, has, actually has a sub-project over, over the, uh, or we're joint with the MJO task force over the maritime continent. So I think that's a, it's a region, and also uh, Ray Zan is going to be talking about uh, the, the ASEAN cough on, on, uh, on Thursday, I think, or Wednesday. And that, that is a, a region where there's certainly some, some skill in these. And so that is just average over Borneo Island. And these are by, these are by Pentad starting in week, uh, on May 28. So that's June, and this is July. And so you can see that there was, there was a, a peak in, in rainfall uh, in late June, and then there was a... Then there was a there, there was an, a negative anomaly, a dry spell in, in July. And you can see that the, the red line is the ECMWF at week two lead and the uh, green line at week three lead. And you can see that even at week three, we can capture, the model could capture some of these, these uh, intra-seasonal swings. And we could really relate it. Uh, the, the blue here is the MJO, is an MJO episode over the Indian Ocean. And uh, the... the the maritime continent, especially over the islands, tends to feel the MJO convection when, it's, when the MJO is actually over the Indian Ocean. So it feels it ahead of the MJO envelope. And then uh, the July is in, is in, is in brown, where uh, it went actually into the Western Pacific sector. So we could identify these swings uh, in, in Borneo rainfall and the, the MJO's uh, observed evolution uh, with, 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 with them. We, we didn't look in the model to, to look at the, the, the model's MJO. And uh, we, we'll, we'll soon have the... Uh, Paula was, was coding up uh, some, of the, some codes to, to do that, but I think that's, that's not quite ready to use in this training, but it's, 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 it's an option that we, we, we'll, we'll have. And then we looked at three different years, uh, 2002, 2001, and, and 1999, and this is just showing with uh, the, the, the Nino SST anomaly. So there was actually a, an El Nino year in 2002, which pushed the whole envelope up. Uh, uh, well, it pushed the whole envelope down, sorry, so we got lower rainfall. Whereas in, in 1999, it was a La Nino year, which tended to push the, the whole envelope in rainfall up. So one thing that we often talk about in, in S2S is the idea of a forecast of opportunity. And are there particular co-phasings of, uh, of phenomena that, that have some predictability, like, like El Nino and uh, MJO, that could give you uh, particular windows of opportunity of good skill. And then this is uh, something to be thinking about in terms of uh, forecast verification. Well, normally, uh, we pool over all the, uh, all, all the forecasts 
to get an estimate of skill, as I showed in, in, this, in this schematic. But uh, if we wanted to do this in, for some kind of forecast of opportunity, should we be doing something more conditional on a particular, particular ENSO or MJO conditions? It's, it's a question uh, of, of relevance to S2S uh, verification. So I want just to draw uh, your attention to the some aspects of the the IR, of, of the S2S database that that are relevant for for doing verification of them, and uh, especially the the hindcast lengths, which are relatively short, uh, of of the of the order of say 18 years for ECMWF, and so if you think that ENSO is playing a a, a large role. Uh, we don't have many ENSO events in, in 18 years, so how are you going to, how are you going to verify that? We, we think we, if we're doing sub-seasonal verification, then we have many more starts to average over. But if there's some non-stationarity, if ENSO is playing a role, maybe the effective number is less. So this could be, could be a problem for models that, that have short hindcast sets. There are other models that are coming more from the seasonal scale, like the Australian POAMA model, which has a much longer uh, hindcast set from 1981 to, to, to 2013. So this is great from that point of view. Unfortunately, the, the Bureau of Meteorology of Australia are now, are now switching to the UK's uh, gl glossy model. <laughs> so so this, in a couple of years, this is going to go away, and this will be replaced by the Met Office system, which uh, they, they said they'll, they'll, have, they'll do more, more hindcasts but it, it will be a, an on-the-fly system, and so that will be limited in the, in the number of years. So these are sort of important things to think about in terms of uh, verifying sub-seasonal forecasts. Then the other one is the hindcast size. So uh, if, we're, if we're doing a verification, we, we would like, and we're using hindcast, we would, we would like to use the, uh, the same configuration of the system that's being used in the real-time forecast for the hindcast. In particular, if we're trying to estimate a forecast distribution, we should have just as many ensemble members as we, as we do in the real-time forecast. And that is uh, typically has been the case in, uh, in uh, seasonal forecasting systems. And you can see the POAMA system there uh, has the same number of ensemble members for the real-time forecast as it does for the hindcast. But it's really uh, the odd one out. So, for example, if you look at uh, ECMWF, there's 51 members for real-time forecasts, but there's uh, only 11 members for, for the hindcast. And this actually is a big improvement. It was just five members until, I think it was uh, May, May or June uh, this year, when they, they, they updated the system. So that, that's another, also another potential issue in uh, if you want to uh, verify uh, hindcasts from, from S2S, how are you going to estimate your, your forecast probabilities if you only have a uh, few uh, on, ensemble members to do that? Um, met methods for estimating the, the, the PDF from a large ensemble can be just, just a, a matter of counting the number of ensemble members that exceed a threshold, for example. But uh, you have to resort, uh, basically you have to resort to some uh, parametric methods if, if you want to use uh, small ensemble size. So fit a, a parametric distribution and do some kind of uh, parametric uh, regression. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, mm -hmm. How many ensemble members is enough? And how much is the low number or high number? I mean, 33 is obvious that it's better than three, but for example, the NMME set the 10 member threshold, so each, mem each model should have at least 10 members. So there's been some work done on that, say, uh, I think uh, there, was, there was some work in the, uh, in uh, the, uh, at ECMWF where they, they, they looked at, well, what is, uh, what's the sensitivity to the ensemble size of, of the skill? I mean, maybe you can think about here, where in some places where you do have large ensembles, what about if I degrade the size of the ensemble? How does that impact on, on my skill?
uh, maybe it's worth mentioning just because you asked that question. Uh, for example, NCEP 4, ECNWF 51. But there's, there's actually a big difference here in that the, the NCEP forecasts are issued every day. So the, the ECNWF forecast is a burst ensemble on Mondays and Thursdays, but uh, the NCEP 1 is, is a lagged ensemble every six hours. So can we pull together uh, several days from, from, from NCEP uh, going, if we, if, say if we're starting uh, today on Monday, can we pull the forecast over, over Sunday, that's four, over Saturday, additional four, uh, over Friday, uh, that, that's another four, then you already have 12. So as, as you're doing that, that kind of uh, lagged ensemble pooling, your forecast gets slightly older, but then that would be offset by having more members. So what's the, uh, what's the trade-off in doing that? So this heterogeneous database where we have, we have all sorts of different ways of doing it can, can help us do research on things like that, uh, relative merits of, of uh, burst ensembles versus, versus lagged ensembles. So I've talked a bit about uh, S2S. Uh, let me talk just a little bit about uh, probabilistic uh, verification. So this is the forecast uh, that, that we issue that I showed this morning uh, for, uh, from the IRI. We, 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 give, we, we divide into tercile categories, and we give the, the probability of the most, most likely category. So uh, we're, 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 we're over, over Borneo here. We have an 80% 80, 80 chance of of below normal. This was issued in May of this year for June, July, August. So was, was this a good forecast or, or not? How could we uh, go about uh, verifying that? And so, I mean, I mentioned that the skill score we need to average over f many forecasts. But what about if we just go and look at what actually happened? So. How are we going to go about doing that since we're just forecasting some, some category here? We're, uh, we're, we're forecasting some category with some probability, like 80% below normal uh, over Borneo. How can we uh, compare that with, uh, with what actually happened, some, some amount of rainfall? Maybe skip that one. So that's the same one on the left here. That's the forecast PDF. The way that uh, if you go to the uh, IRI's forecast uh, net assessment, if you go back to previous ones, and then if you take a regional view like uh, a the Asia region here, you, there's an actually a little box you can tick on verifying observation. And what this pulls up here is the CAMS... Uh, OPI, so this is the uh, 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 merged satellite uh, gauge product that's used for, for uh, monitoring. So it's kept up to date. And it's in the IRI data library. And the way that we plotted it here is, oh, now I could show this. In terms of the, uh, the spread over, over all years, what percentile uh, was it in this, in this uh, past June, July, August. Uh, was it? Well, we said it was would have an eighty percent chance of being in the below normal, uh, thirty-three percent. So where did it where did it end up lying? And uh, this what's shown here: percentile of observation relative to nineteen seventy-one to two thousand climatology. And so we can see that it uh, it was around the thirty-third percentile. So. Uh, or in, in northern Borneo, we were, it, it was actually much more extreme. You can, you can see there's more variation uh, spatially in the observation to what there was in the forecast. And though those forecasts are made at quite, quite low resolution, about a 300 kilometer grid. So this is one way of doing it, right? A, for, a, a probabilistic forecast can't be, can't be right or wrong unless we forecast 100% or 0%. Uh, and we're careful never to do that. So we, we could compare and see uh, that w where we were, where the year actually was. And we think that this, can, this is a, a kind of a, a nice way that uh, users can, can go in and, and, and look at a particular forecast to see, 
uh, how it how it compared. So, what about some uh, key attributes of uh, uh, probabilistic forecasts? What I want to just describe to you are two here uh, that sort of go together. Sharpness refers to the, the concentration of the forecast distributions. The, the sharper, the better, provided the predictive distributions are calibrated. And reliability, are the forecast probability correct on average? Or is there some systematic bias uh, toward under or, or overconfidence? So in our forecast, we would want to have, for sharp forecasts, we want to have forecasts where we get lots of color on this map, where we get really... Uh, we get really into the, the browns and the, the, the deep blues here, that we have lots of, lots of that. So that the forecasts are sharp. They're sticking their head out. They're saying that for a particular category, we have a high probability of that. We're not wishy-washy, 33%, uh, 33%, 33%, which is all the white areas there where we, we don't have any skill. Razan. We, we need to, to get some kind of score. We, we need to average over many cases. But this can give us an idea of looking at one particular forecast and comparing it with a... It's a way to, to compare uh, one forecast, probabilistic forecast with a verifying observation. So, so you mean that the, it might not be fair to be saying that... Uh, no, I thought it, it could be. I don't know. I'm just wondering. I'm not sure. Could, could you do something like that? I, I don't... I'm not sure you can do anything... You, I don't think you can do anything quantitatively, but it can, it can give a, uh, someone a feel for well, what, what that means if, you, if you're making a, a probabilistic forecast. And in terms of the distribution, well, what actually happened? And so in developing a, a feel for being able to make, uh, make sense of this, this uh, kind of forecast uh, format on the left, I don't, I don't know what you think. Uh, if you think that it, if, it, if, it can, if, you think it, if you think it can help. <laughs> Steve? Well, one, one way, if you wanted to try and call that forecast, would be to compare the, the distribution of the uh, Yeah, that, isn't that the reliability uh, well, measure? Yeah, but in the reliability, you tend to be thinking about that by averaging over many forecasts mm. for a particular, you know, particular location or area rather than in the spatial. I'm not sure that it could, even then, it kind of, you still have to worry about the fact that some places you've got an 80% probability of it's below normal, and some places you've got a 50% of it. Yeah, this, is, this has a. Uh, maybe this is going into too much detail with putting the uh, the uh, full percentile uh, rank, uh, because the other way of doing this is to just put the tercile category. And so, if it fell in the in the below normal, then then we'll put uh, we'll put yellow. If it fell in near normal, we'll put grey. And if it fell in above normal, we'll put green. Which is the other way of doing it. And that's the way that Ryzan showed a couple of weeks ago in Aziankov, uh in in looking at. Uh, comparing the previous COFS forecast with what actually happened. My, 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 think, my, my thinking there is that it's nice to know, you know how far away you were. <laughs> uh, 
and, and this gives you this gives you some indication that if, you know toward maybe toward ex, more, toward extremes as well that we're not just looking at the three three categories but but maybe this is overly ambitious uh, putting these uh, <laughs> this this uh, ranking percentile of the the observation for a specific group let's say we have 15 ensemble members how can we say that uh, it will be below normal or above normal or forecast. So what you can do is uh, you, you you can just uh, count the number of ensemble members that, that fo falls into those uh, three categories. But uh, maybe your your question is well, fifteen isn't very many for counting that. And normal well, what we do is we in order to to make this we we use a parametric approach. Where we'll use the ensemble, we will we only use the ensemble mean uh, to get the mean of uh, transformed Gaussian, and then we get the the standard deviation, the spread of the Gaussian uh, comes from the uh, Heinkast errors essentially by by looking at the performance over past years. So there's a parametric approach of doing it, and there's a there's a counting approach of doing it, and it may well be that uh, using parametric approach is, is uh, the way to go with sub-seasonal sub -seasonal forecasting. And I'll show, I'll show an example of that later. Is there any publication out there? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few publications actually in the, uh, in the, in the weather forecasting community by uh, uh, Tom Hamill and, and, and Dan Wilkes on uh, extended logistic regression where what you want to predict is actually a probability uh, rather than, rather than uh, using, uh, using ensemble mean. Because the, the, uh, the Gaussian approach or transformed Gaussian is, is uh, better suited to a seasonal forecast rather than when you get down to a, a weekly or, or a daily one. We, we, there's actually a paper by Tippett et al. where they, they looked at the... The relative, the the how how good it is using a parametric approach versus uh, using a counting approach, and they compared the two methods, and they found that uh, the, the 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 parametric approach was uh, somewhat better. It, it it gave a higher skill. So reliability reliability and sharpness. Let me explain these a bit. So the reliability, uh, this says, did we cor correctly indicate the uncertainty in the forecast? Uh, shows how well the forecast probabilities correspond to the subsequent observed relative frequency of occurrence across full range of issued forecast probabilities. So what happens here is that uh, we plot the forecast probability against the observed relative frequency on, on a chart like this. Uh, pooling across uh, typically many points. So this will be uh, done for, uh, here it's over all uh, tropical land areas. And so what we do is to, to look, to plot uh, all the times that, these are done for different uh, TERSOG categories. So the above normal one there is in, in green. And for example, we will plot uh, the, the uh, for all the times that we issue a forecast probability uh, of 0.5 uh, of being in the above normal category, how often did that happen? It's, it's a 50-50% chance, so it should happen on average with a, with, a, with a 0.5 probability. So if the forecasts are reliable, they should lie on this diagonal line where what you forecast on average is, is what you get. And it shouldn't be that you're forecasting 80% uh, probability a lot of times, but then if you look at all the times when you forecasted 80% probability of being b above normal, you find, you find that uh, uh, that didn't actually uh, happen very often. And your forecast was, wasn't successful very often. And so this is a, a, a nice... Uh, calibrated case where things generally align, 
along this uh, diagonal line uh, for the above and, and below normal categories. But you'll notice that uh, it's not at all the case for the near normal. <coughs> so what we find in our seasonal forecasts, uh, even if uh, the Arkoffs may, may like to hedge toward the uh, issuing higher probabilities in the, in the central tercile, we, we don't have any skill for forecasts issued in, in that uh, category. And if you go and look at our maps, you'll, you'll, you'll know, you'll, you scarcely find anything uh, in, in the gray. Uh, maybe, maybe that has to do also with the fact that it's not issued very often. Because, we're, because of this, because there's no skill. The forecasts don't have any skill uh, in, that, in that category. And so we only issue that there's a, there's a mask, if you like, on here, where white means there's no forecast, there's no skill. So there's just climatological probabilities, which means one third, one third, one third. Well, I, think, I don't think it means that. It means that uh, there's no skill in forecasts that uh, have that uh, in, in that case. Incidentally, I mean, this, this is a, a, a forecast for a strong El Nino year, right, this year. And we have very strong probabilities here of, of 70%. But if you were to look at back across our forecast for previous years, you'll find that uh, uh, we're, we're much more generally uh, forecasting uh, light yellows or, or light greens. This is a very bullish forecast uh, with a lot of sharpness, but they're not generally that sharp. We don't often uh, issue forecasts that uh, in the in the 80th percentile for below normal. And that's the other thing here uh, that is given alongside normally uh, associated with the sharpness and measures whether or not forecasts vary much from their climatological distribution. And most, most seasonal forecasts avoid being overly precise by using, say, tercile or, or five categories. And uh, it would be really sharp if you were issuing near zero or one. But if most of the forecast probabilities are in the range of 40 to 60 percent, then the forecast system would be said to be smooth or not sharp. And so, although in that particular forecast it was sharp over, over Indonesia, uh, this, if you look back uh, in general, this is how often we, we issue. Again, a green is for the above normal category, and brown is for the uh, below normal, and gray is for near normal. This is how often we issue those forecasts. And you can see up here in the point eight, it's almost not showing at all. Uh, we... we we don't often issue forecasts with that, with that probability. And so plotting this kind of reliability diagram is challenging in that we don't have many samples up uh, for, for high probability or, or low probability. We have lots in the middle, because this is how often we issue the forecast, but we don't have many uh, in, as, as, you, uh, as you get away from the... Uh, the, the the 33rd percentile equiprobability. And this is typical of, of seasonal forecast systems, that they tend to be uh, relatively smooth. In order, in order to be well, well calibrated, they have to be smooth. So uh, calibration can be thought of as uh, making the, the, the forecast as sharp as possible so that uh, you do issue things like this, uh, nice sharp forecasts, but... Uh, Maintaining, maintaining reliability so that if you plot on average, it'll lie on the diagonal line, even if you're, most of your forecasts are uh, around, uh, around about issuing just the climatological forecast. Adrian? No, I think, I think you can... Mm. 
Yeah, I think uh, that, that com we haven't done that comparison. If the, uh, if the ECMWF system done in that way can be shown to be reliable, I'm sure it would be more sharp than this. There was, there was another question you were saying? <coughs> for a specific region, there are like 50 percent of above normal. But when uh, the predictions are updated next month, it goes directly from 50 percent of above normal to 50 percent of below normal. So when this kind of situation is happening, is it the reliability of the forecast? Can we attribute it to the reliability or what kind of criteria is it? So, I mean, those forecasts are not very sharp. If it's a 50% probability, we're, we're still quite in, in the, the, the middle of the distribution. So going be between, you know, uh, 40 below versus 40 above, that, that is, they're, they're really sort of neighboring uh, they're, they're, they're almost like neighboring forecasts in a way. It, I would be concerned if, if it went from like 80 to 20, something like that. So it, maybe this one, uh, uh, I just put this one in at the last minute. This is showing the, uh, the advantages of, of using a pooling over models and, and building a multi-model ensemble. So it's been shown uh, in, in seasonal forecasts that you can improve the reliability by using a combination of multiple models. And uh, that's shown here for three, three individual models. This is for July, August, September, precip, uh, 30, 30 south to 30 north. And the, the individual purple lines here, uh, this is the above normal on the, on the left and the below normal on the right, are the, 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 uh, the reliability diagram for the individual models. And you can see that they're overconfident because they're more, they're more horizontal than the, the diagonal line. So that uh, if, they, they, if we forecast uh, above normal with an 80% 80 probability, that is only happening 40% uh, uh, of the time. So they're, they're overconfident. If we pull them together without doing anything special, we can get this black line here. So uh, that is uh, just uh, making one big ensemble out of the three models. Uh, here's for the below normal as well. And then the green line here, I forget the uh, technique that was used, but this is using, a, uh, in, in the two-tier two system, using some uh, performance-based uh, combination weighting of the models. And uh, you can see you can in improve the reliability even more. It may be that with, with today's models, if we just pool uh, ensemble members, we can actually get uh, pretty close to this, this dashed line. And I think I've seen results like that coming out of ECMWF, that if you have a large ensemble, you can, you can get pretty reliable forecasts without uh, having to do any kind of special, special uh, uh, calibration. So... In the S2S project, we would like to know, well, what's the, what's the case for the sub-seasonal scale? Is it, is it also the case that if we uh, make a multi-model combination over, over several models that we can improve the uh, skill of the forecasts? And so we have a, a sub-project on, on verification for uh, various questions like, like that. And I thought I would just uh, put this put this up. If you go to the uh, S2S webpage, uh, you can go to uh, sub-projects and you can, you can find a document uh, that has all of this information in it. Sorry, I was, I was in Singapore the, the week before last and I, I came back to, to New York and uh, the, uh, 
the, the climate shock there, it was sort of similar temperature to this or even lower. I came down with a, a, a cold and a, and, a, and a slight chest infection. Hopefully that didn't come from... The, the, in Singapore, there's a lot of people that are sick because of the, the haze from the forest fires that was caused by El Nino. <laughs> anyway, I, I hope you can uh, catch what I'm saying. So we, we talked about those, those a, uh, a couple of attributes, sharpness, reliability. There, there are others that I didn't mention, discrimination, uh, resolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but you know, what, what are the forecast quality attributes that are important when verifying an S2S forecast? And how, how should they be assessed? Should we be looking at uh, weekly averages, or should we look at uh, week three and uh, week four? Uh, pulled together, which verification methods and uh, forecast attributes are, are appropriate uh, uh, for reporting to users as well. So we may use uh, anomaly correlation for scientific purposes, but for reporting to users, we, we shouldn't do that. Uh, something I mentioned, how, how should issues of short hindcast period availability and reduced number of ensemble members in hindcast compared to real-time forecasts be dealt with uh, in constructing uh, these measures. Do we, use, do we need to use some uh, parametric approaches? Oh, sorry. I mentioned this thing about uh, identifying windows of forecast opportunity. Uh, how, should they, how should we go about identifying those? Uh, and assessing the contribution between of uh, climate drivers. So, uh, in your cases, uh, when, when you're looking at the, the uh, S2S forecast in your region, you can be thinking about uh, what those drivers might be for your region. Uh, maybe soil moisture might be one, for example. How about extreme events? Uh, when extreme events uh, have this uh, perennial problem of uh, uh, rarity, just by definition, so when we have this coupled with the small uh, sample sizes in, in the S2S database, how should we go about, go about that? Uh, there's some other ones here like uh, uh, active and break phases uh, uh, of monsoons, wet and dry spells. And then what about uh, thinking about uh, verification in, uh, in, a, in a seamless manner uh, across timescales? So we are trying... Uh, a couple of things to uh, look at, uh, verify skill probabilistically for sub-monthly forecasts. And uh, I showed you those anomaly correlation maps uh, at the beginning. This is an attempt. Uh, this is now using the, the S2S database. Uh, so this is a reliability diagram for forecasts issued by uh, the CFS V2 model uh, for July, August, September, and this is a short period of 1999 to 2010 uh, for one to four weeks lead. And so that's the different colors in here. Week one uh, in, in, in uh, purple going down to week four in, in green for, for the three uh, uh, TERSOL categories over the, the, the U.S. And what we have been... Uh, experimenting here with this is uh, extended logistic regression, which enable you to take the uh, the forecast probability as a as a predictand in the regression, and the the uh, the predictor in this case is the ensemble mean of the uh, CFS V2. I can't remember now if it's pooling over a lagged ensemble to do this, but uh, a first result here. It seems like we are we are getting some. Uh, reliability of these forecasts coming out in, in these weekly averages. I just want to emphasize last thing here in terms of the forecast format. I mean, what should this, uh, what should this really be for a, uh, a week three, week four outlook? This is the way that uh, uh, CPC is, is doing, doing this uh, in terms of they're using uh, simple uh, below normal uh, above, above normal uh, forecast probability. So it's similar uh, 
it's similar in, in, in nature to the kind of seasonal forecast uh, probability format. But if you come to a daily weather forecast, where now we're looking at, you know, uh, what is actually happening on each day, then maybe there's a probability of rain. But if you're thinking, uh, you know, three weeks out, is an anomaly format really what you want to be giving, or, or should you really be giving uh, some estimate of the, uh, the, 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 the total precipitation uh, in, in, in that given week, or, or some, some statistic of, of, of daily, daily rainfall within that. So I think there's some questions as to, to how we really want to uh, format and issue forecasts on those scales uh, that should be informed also by uh, user perspectives of what would be useful. But this will also play into the way that uh, we, we want to verify these. Uh, what kind of score should be used? Should we be uh, looking at weekly averages or, or maybe DECAD is better? I think ACMAD uh, issue uh, 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 DECADL uh, advisories. And so maybe we want to look at uh, you know, DECADs for, uh, for the month rather than looking at these, these uh, weekly weekly averages, for example. So summary of the main, main points. Uh, forecast verification requires large sets of forecasts or re-forecasts. And uh, this is uh, uh, challenging for S2S, where we have these, these uh, shorter data sets and, and smaller ensemble sizes. Uh, verification involves considering many attributes of, of forecast quality. And uh, we should think about well, which ones are most most uh, opportune and, and uh, for, for on the on the subseasonal scale, so there is a, a, a sub project in S two S on on this topic, and uh, we are encouraging, uh, trying to encourage community involvement toward really S two S verification issues. And uh, lastly, calibration intimately involves verification. Uh, because it seeks to ma maximize the sharpness while maintaining the reliability. But this is something I'll talk a bit about on Wednesday. Uh, if you, in order to derive your, 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 your calibration, you also need to use the reforecast data. So you, 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 need not, you need to make sure that you're not using the same data twice to, to uh, uh, calibrate your forecast as well as, well as verify it. So thank you. I think I'll leave it there. Uh, take any questions. Coming out.